The Nigeria Center for Disease Control has reported a total of 105 new coronavirus cases and one death related and what related death in the last 24 hours. Eight states and the federal capital territory, Abuja, are responsible for the latest tally. Till date, the country has seen a total of 214,218 confirmed cases and 2,977 have died with the virus. The NCDC has confirmed Nigeria's first two cases of the Omicron variant among travelers from South Africa who arrived in Nigeria last week. Meanwhile, Canada has added Nigeria, Malawi, and Egypt to the list of African countries from which it is banning travelers and missed concerns uh, about the spread of COVID-19's Omicron variant. The latest addition to the previous list of seven countries from which travelers will not be admitted were announced by the country's health minister at a news conference earlier. Canada expanded its travel ban as the Netherlands acknowledged yesterday that the Omicron uh, variant appeared to have reached the country before it was identified in South Africa last week. First, we will be adding three countries to the list of seven countries we currently have that we spoke about last Friday. These countries are Egypt, Malawi and Nigeria. As a reminder, foreign nationals from all of these countries, and now from these 10 countries, these foreign nationals who have been to those countries will not be able to enter Canada if they have been to those countries over the past two weeks. Also, Canadians and permanent residents, as well as all of those who have the right to return to Canada, who have transited through these 10 countries over the past two weeks, well, when they return to Canada quarantine, they will have to be tested at the airport and wait for their results before exiting quarantine. That is for Canadians and permanent residents who are vaccinated. For those who are unvaccinated, will follow the current measures for all countries. That is, they will be tested on day one, quarantine for 14 days and be tested again on day eight. We are announcing today is that all air travelers coming from outside Canada, apart from the United States, will now need to be tested at the airport in which they are landing in Canada, whether they are vaccinated or unvaccinated. They will then need to isolate themselves until they get the result of their test. Obviously, those that come to Canada um, and are not vaccinated from anywhere in the world uh, need to do a quarantine of 14 days as it has always been the, the, the case and do a test both on day one and on day eight. And in the United States, the head of Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has said that there was no evidence that the Omicron variant is in the United States. Speaking at the White House COVID-19 briefing, Dr. Rochelle Walensky that the Delta variant remained the dominant strain. Dr. Anthony Fauci, the chief medical advisor to the White House, said as of yesterday morning that the global case count hit 226 cases in 20 countries, which he said was rising rapidly. Let me express how grateful we are to the South African government and to their expert scientists who have been open in their communication and willing to share their data with CDC and the entire world. Their collaboration has allowed us to make evidence-based decisions quickly and to ensure that we can protect as many people as possible from COVID-19. We are actively looking for the Omicron variant right here in the United States. Right now, there is no evidence of Omicron in the United States. The Delta variant remains a predominant circulating strain representing 99.9% of all sequences sampled. Confirmed cases as of yesterday was 205 in 18 countries. And just this morning, that's gone up to 226 in 20 countries. And I think you're gonna expect to see those numbers change rapidly. Importantly, that has not yet been detected in the United States. And what about disease severity? Again, these are estimates. And with the small number of cases, it is very difficult to know whether or not this particular variant is going to result in severe disease. Although some preliminary information from South Africa suggests no unusual symptoms associated with variant, we do not know, and it is too early 
to tell. Some anecdotal reports out of South Africa that the physicians, mostly private physicians, who've been seeing patients are seeing that they appear to be a less of a severity of illness. But you said quite correctly, most of those are among younger individuals. We believe that it is too soon to tell of what the level of severity is. We, Dr. Walensky and I specifically asked our South African colleagues that on the most recent Zoom call that we had, and they agreed with us that it's too early to tell. They're hoping that it is going to, across the board, give a lower level of severity, but they don't know that right now. So they agree with us. And All right, Tundu, a lot is happening. Yes, I'm not really surprised that Canada has added Nigeria to the list of the countries that they've banned because obviously we were told that they discovered Omicron in two cases, two travelers who came from Nigeria. So I guess that was inevitable. But it still remains sort of, I think, ill-thought-out, the travel ban. I mean, in some ways, Japan's even makes more sense. They have gone all the way and banned every single foreign non-resident. That even makes more sense because it's all over the world at this point, not just in Africa. So banning a few African countries, really, I don't know how that's really going to stop anything. And apart from that, now, not that I'm, I'm sanctioning what Japan did, but if we're talking about logic, that makes a lot more sense. But we have to decide because I'm sure I know you feel very strongly about anti-vaxxers and that propaganda that they've been promoting on social media and even, you know, news media. But the fact of the matter is anti-vaxxers are ignoring the science and looking to politics. But I find that even world authorities are doing the same thing. We all have to decide, are we going to trust the science or not? You don't get to pick and choose what part of the science you trust, what part that you want to reject. Mm. So this is the issue. How different are the rest of those people sure. from anti-vaxxers? It's sure. all the same spectrum, mm -hmm. isn't it? They are like the far end of the wedge, the thick end of the wedge. But a lot of these world authorities in different countries, I'm sorry, they're exhibiting similar hysteria, yeah. similar, completely random, illogical, knee-jerk decision-making. It has to be rooted in science, or oh, what is the point? Mm -hmm. And this is exactly why we have the anti-vax movement that is so powerful, that has gotten us into this trouble in the first <coughs> case, which, well, that's part of why. The mm -hmm. fact that even in Western countries, in the developed world, where vaccines are available, some people are refusing to take them, is this kind of contradictory policy-making mm -hmm. that seems really haphazard. That encourages that kind of sentiment. And obviously, the same issue again of vaccine and equity around the world. It's not not about equality now, it's about equity. So this whole notion of, oh, well, African countries should really have tried a bit harder. Of course we should have, but we didn't. Mm. And now we're facing the problem that we're facing. So we, it does need to be addressed. Equity, not equality. So I really don't want to get, get into the equality argument, because really for me, right now it's a moot point. But um, Anthony Fauci's comments, um, I was a bit dampened my enthusiasm a little bit, because I was really trusting the South African anecdotal evidence, as he's described it, which really it is, that the symptoms are mild to moderate. And he has put some context saying that that's based on a very you know, small number of patients in private hospitals. And it's true. We don't actually know the age of those people who presented mild to moderate symptoms. We don't know their medical history. We don't know if you know, other people could have life-threatening symptoms in a different demographic. We just don't know anything at this point, which is the worrying issue. Dr. Patti? Okay, I think certain things, uh, you know, can be immediately established. One, that uh, Omicron, the detection, the announcement of the Omicron variant has put uh, some kind of pause, you know, uh, to the economic recovery process in the world. It has upended all expectations. And the matter has not been helped by the fact that Omicron is spreading rapidly across countries. Uh, two days ago, it was 46 countries. Now we're told up to about 69 countries have imposed uh, travel restrictions. And matters have also been helped by the declaration yesterday by the CEO of Moderna that existing vaccines may be ineffective against uh, this new variant. And that this new variant, scientists may not even be able uh, to arrive at any definitive conclusions about it until maybe the middle of next year. So the whole world is in a state of a suspended animation. And the markets reacted on Friday. The markets reacted again yesterday, uh, particularly with the uh, chairman of the uh, 
U.S. Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, uh, for that reason, anxieties and more or less revising his earlier uh, statement about uh, inflationary rates being uh, transitory. Now, so you now find in the face of all of this, great uncertainty in every sphere, uh, either in terms of travel and tourism or policy options by governments. And many governments are just simply trying to be cautious. So Canada had announced previously that two travelers on Sunday, uh, you know, who were Nigerians, although there's no direct flight between Canada and Nigeria, had presented with symptoms of uh, Omicron. Now, Indonesia also early in the week uh, put Nigeria on the list. Paraguay also put Nigeria on the list. So all of these countries, I guess, are just trying to be uh, cautious to protect themselves uh, while waiting for scientists to come up with you know, uh, very definite uh, statements, particularly with regard to the virulence or the uh, transmissibility of this new variant of uh, COVID-19. So I would not like to blame any country because sovereign interest comes first. Public health and safety within your own territory comes first. And it is to be noted that initially when, you know, we try to say, well, there's some racism involved in this and South Africa protested. As you speak, Rwanda and Angola have also banned you know, restricted flights to or from uh, some countries in Southern Africa, the usual countries that even countries of the West identify. And these are African countries, and they're just trying to be uh, careful, which now leads me to the Nigerian story. Now, very late yesterday, the uh, Nigeria Center for Disease Control now came forward to say that, look, now we can establish that there are two cases of Omicron uh, that have been uh, identified in Nigeria. Uh, less than 24 hours earlier, the NCDC was still saying that there was no detected case in Nigeria and that they were involved in surveillance and research. And we had raised the concern that, look, there had been a report in Canada, there had been some reaction from Paraguay and also from Indonesia and Nigeria mentioned. Is there something that they know in those countries that Nigeria did not know at that appointed time? But it turned out uh, that yesterday two cases through the process of genome sequencing, travelers from South Africa were identified as having showed up in our shores. We're told that they are asymptomatic and that uh, the authorities have introduced, have embarked on uh, contact tracing to find out who and who their contacts may be. In other words, uh, if these were two persons who arrived in Nigeria from Southern Africa, it may well be, you know, that, they've been, uh, that there must be some kind of uh, spread. So vigilance on the part of the NCDC uh, is very important. However, that NCDC statement also said that, in fact, they detected traces of the Omicron uh, variant in samples that have been collected in October 2021. Uh, Could it be that the Omicron variant had been in Nigeria even long before yes. it was detected in South Africa and it was announced on November 24 uh, by the South Africans? Because the statement was very clear that it detected Omicron in samples collected here in Nigeria in October 2021. What is the lesson of that? Simply that the NCDC and other relevant agencies involved in this fight against the pandemic should be a bit cautious in making definitive statements in jumping the gun. Because the way they were saying no uh, Omicron in Nigeria, no Omicron variant in Nigeria, I thought that there was something suspicious, uh, something overly enthusiastic in the manner in which the NCDC uh, was going about it. However, two things to note from the statement that has been issued by the uh, Nigerian Center for Disease Control, which is one, the recommendation to states. States are being told uh, to, wrap up, uh, to ramp up uh, what they call the, uh, rapid antigen, anti, the antigen rapid test, particularly in situations where there could be a, a threat of community transmission mm -hmm. and when there is, where there is a large uh, collection of uh, populations. Well, I hope that uh, the NCDC will go beyond just making that uh, recommendation and liaise with the states uh, to make sure that they have access to the facilities and that they take this as a very serious issue, particularly as Nigeria, uh, as, as the case in many other countries, is moving into a festive season. The NCDC also has recommendations uh, for citizens and we are being told that we should follow the basic protocols, wear your mask, avoid uh, you know, unnecessary uh, socializing, 
uh, you know, ensure physical distancing, wash your hands regularly, and I hope that both the Minister of Information and the National Orientation Agency will liaise with the NCDC and other, you know, uh, uh, agencies at the subnational levels, you know, to make sure that this is done. And now, having said all of this, it's not enough that the NCDC has said we've detected, uh, you know, two cases from uh, Southern Africa. Would the NCDC, what would the NCDC recommend to the Presidential Steering Committee on COVID-19 in Nigeria? Should it recommend that Nigeria should go ahead, like Rwanda and Angola and other countries, to suspend flights mm. to and fro certain countries in Southern Africa? Mm. Because that would seem to be the logical sense in terms of uh, uh, self-preservation. Mm. Would Nigeria go that far? Nigeria, having expressed solidarity, <coughs> with South Africa in the spirit of African Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. When the story first broke and the South Africans had cause to complain about uh, discrimination, whereas uh, South Africa should have been commended for its transparency in uh, making useful scientific information available to the international community. I think at the end of the day, uh, with this threat to public health and safety, the primary consideration for the Nigerian authorities should be our safety first, the national interest public safety in Nigeria. So, I, I mean, <clears throat> I know we need to go to another story, but I just have to sound off on this issue. Real quickly, that's why I feel the travel bans are ill-advised over the world. We have to tell ourselves the truth. The fact that Omicron was being sequestered in South Africa didn't mean didn't exist before now. Detection doesn't mean origin. Yes. Exactly. It was just sequenced out of South Africa. And I'll take you back, even to the Delta variant. They had sequenced a strain that was close to the Delta variant months before there was a big declaration of the sequencing. And I'm happy, like you pointed out, Dr. Bati, now that the NCDC was talking about the fact that they sequenced a strain related to the Omicron that had strains of Omicron way back in October. So these mutations have been going on. And this targeting some countries is really ill-advised. I'll talk more about this in other segments. Moving on, the Lagos State uh, government has released its white paper on the report by NSAS panel that investigated Lekki Tollgate incident in October last year. Out of the 32 recommendations, the government appears to have accepted 11, rejected one, accepted six with modifications that said 14 recommendations fell outside the powers and will be forwarded to the federal government for consideration. Uh, I, I think the, the conversation is out in this. Uh, the white paper is finally out uh, within the two-week timeline. A prelude to the white paper was a speech by the governor yesterday. He called for peace. He called for a peace walk, called some activists to join out, deliberately called out some names. Some of those activists have given rebuttals as regards that. But the sticky point in the white paper, the document, is about the number of people that died. Did people die or not? Other recommendations, yes, some were pushed to the federal government, like the case about the military, you know, uh, to be prosecuted and the police officers to be prosecuted. The, the, the reaction in the white paper to that was, okay, we'll put that to the federal government. They have their own disciplinary committee for these forces. But the sticky point is the memorialization of the toll gates, uh, the government reacted by saying, okay, we'll build a peace park. That's what they said they'll do in the white paper. As regards uh, creating a memorial in the toll gates, the government said, no, we won't do that because the bony and the contentious issue here is did people even die in the toll gate in the first place? So that's the thrust of what was written in the white paper. I mean, pretty much follows the lines of you know, the conversation that have been enunciated thus far as regards, oh, did people die? Was the report correct about people dying or not? I mean, that's pretty much the bulk of what happened. Other recommendations like training the uh, Lashem, what city is called, Lagos State Sanitation uh, Agency, they said more training will be done as regards that. Other recommendations as regards, uh, you know, bridging the peace. I think some of it the governor has started yesterday by calling for a peace walk, uh, reinforcing, you know, that trust between the authorities and the youth. I think he started yesterday by saying there's going to be a peace walk. But the sticky point is the, the main thrust of the disagreement here by the people that say, oh, something happened at the Lekki Target, and the people that say, okay, nothing happened, you can't prove it, is the part the government rejected in the white paper. Pretty much along the lines of the arguments that have been enunciated by people that are in support that nothing happened 
And some people are saying, this is the sticky, the thorny part. Uh, something did happen, and we must know what really happened. We don't have a lot of time because, you know, we just don't. And we'll be talking to the Attorney General of Lagos later, so I'll save most of it for that. But, yes, I think the governor calling for this peace walk is aligned with Recommendation 11, I believe, trying yes. to, you know, build a bridge. But he has been publicly rebuffed by some of those he publicly invited on the peace walk. And there are two ways of looking at that. You know, Boris Johnson was in the news last week for that botched speech that he gave about Pepper Pigland. Mm. And it reminded me of Gordon Brown during his um, election campaign against David Cameron. He invited Pepper Pig to come out, I think maybe to appeal to young parents. And Pepper Pig rebuffed his invitation. She stood up the the, the cartoon character, this pink <laughs> pig called Pepper, Pepper, stood up the prime minister and was really like political egg on his face. And that is what it is like for me. That's a call to mind what has happened with Governor Solomon, who being publicly rebuffed in that manner. Because, you know, it now also reminds me of the 80s African Americans who were protesting, which unfortunately they still are. Mm. Then it was no justice, no peace. Mm. And then now it's Black Lives Matter. But it reminds me, no justice, no peace, until people can see that the reforms are actually being undertaken until changes have been made, they might not really want to go on a peace walk. It might mm. be premature to try and go on a symbolic mm. peace walk because mm. what is needed now is not symbolism. Mm. On the other hand, it can also <clears throat> detract from the message the youth is trying to send in the sense that some people might perceive it as a governor offering an olive branch and being rebuffed. Like, what do you want? That we're trying so this is, instead of having the reforms first, that we should have the peace walk and then build from there, that the fact that he's rebuffed will mean that they're not interested in any kind of dialogue, which was a criticism that some people had about the NSAS protests, that the youth refused to come to the table, said they don't have leaders, mm. which they clearly do, because the governor was able to name some names. There are leaders of the mm -hmm. youth movement. So I, there are two ways of looking at it. I'm sure we'll have more time to interrogate this. Well, the uh, governor received the report of the... Uh Judicial Panel of Inquiry on November 15, and he immediately set up uh, a white paper panel chaired by the Attorney General and Commissioner for Justice, who will be on this program later, and gave a mandate of two weeks, which expired November 29. And within that space of two weeks, we got the report yesterday, although some people said, oh, why was it released uh, so late? But that's neither here nor there. The question to ask is, what is the next step forward? Mm. The Lagos State Government accepted 11 of the recommendations, modified six of the recommendations. The remaining uh, you know, recommendations, about 14 of them, rejected one, and then the remaining 40 recommendations have been forwarded uh, to the federal government and other appropriate authorities to the extent that they do not fall within the legal powers and authority of the Lagos State uh, Government. The question is, one, would the federal government, which had publicly, through the Minister of Information, uh, follow some of those recommendations that have been forwarded to it. You will recall that some of those recommendations have to do with, you know, the panel asking that certain military officers who were involved yeah. uh, in one way or the other, or another officer who did not appear before the panel uh, to give a testimony uh, should be sanctioned. Would the federal government do that? And, you know, in that regard, we had had two reactions from the federal government. Uh, Festus Kiyamo, uh, dismissing the, uh, like questioning the jurisdiction and the legality of the Lagos State Panel, and the Minister of Information dismissing the entire report, uh, I guess before even reading it, as uh, fake news and a collection of tales by moonlight. As for the Lagos State Government, the Lagos State Government has made very clear those recommendations that it will accept. One, the Lagos State government says there are inconsistencies and contradictions in that report. It mm. rejects the fact that there was a massacre in context, mm. and it relies on the evidence provided by the chief pathologist of Lagos State, uh, Professor John uh, Obafunwa, who said there were three persons who died, only one from a, a gun wound uh, injury, and that it is not true that 19 people died. And that report details inconsistencies on pages 297 to 298, for example, where two persons uh, were reported to have died twice. And then also, in some other parts, a certain uh, Nathaniel uh, uh, Johnson, uh, who was a witness and who was reported to have died, whereas it was his brother, one Abuta Solomon, uh, Abuta Johnson, uh, who died. So all those contradictions were pointed out. But this Lagos State government uh, has shown good faith, in my view, and good signaling 
by talking about a peace walk. That peace walk was announced even before the white paper uh, was released. The question to ask is, uh, those gentlemen, uh, Shionkuti, Fals, and uh, Shegun, uh, Segalink, and others, you know, who have, uh, uh, Farutime, who have rejected the offer to be part of, part of that peace walk, would they at some point, now that the details of the white paper are out there in the public domain, uh, you know, change their mind, reconsider the offer by our government? Because beyond the uh, payment of compensation, Lagos State has already paid over 400 million. It is committed to paying more. It is committed to declaring uh, a toll free day every October 20. It says it will set up a park, not at the Lekki toll gate, mm. but elsewhere. You know, and so many other concessions. He commended Redington Hospital and other hospitals who treated people who sustained injuries, but not necessarily gunshot wounds because the government, uh, you know, is contending that. Now, all of that, what Lagos State needs, what the country needs, is healing, is reconciliation with that process be put in place. Mm -hmm. It even agrees to set up, to engage youths more, to set up Human Rights Commission at the state level. Now, all of that are positives. But of course, uh, the white paper is out there. What is important is what next at the state level and at the federal level, and in terms of engagement mm. between the state and the other stakeholders who are saying uh, justice must be done. All right. That's all on New Zealand. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll have Rotos, we'll have Michael Wilson, we'll have Aaron Akerjala to give us updates in Africa, global business, and sport and activities across the globe. Stay with us. Back to the morning show here on Arise News, our dependable and most unnationalistic Rotus Ajiri <laughs> is here to give us an Africa business update. Good morning. You know, the, discuss the vigorous discussion we we're just having before we came on, <laughs> it reminds me of your morning show promo with uh, OG, where the director is saying, Come in, I said you're debating so much. So, yeah, good morning, Dr. Uh, Tundu, uh, Rufai, our viewers. Uh, so we'll get to that in a second. But very quickly, kicking off with energy. Um, NNPC is saying that climate activists are in part responsible for the worsening energy crisis. Uh, this was at the 10th Practical Nigerian Content Conference in uh, Yenagoa, Bayelsa State. According, this was according to the Group Executive Director Upstream NNPC, Mr. Adoki uh, Tombomi Mie, and uh, he said that, look, um, they are put, activists are putting pressure on banks, they are putting pressure on governments, and as such, it is um, reducing the amount of fossil fuel investments um, that Nigeria depends on. He says uh, Nigerians have to look inwards, and he said that the Petroleum Industry Act will hopefully bring more investment into Nigeria. The jury is out on that as to whether or not that is going to take the place. And you, I don't know if you can really place all the blame on the energy crisis that we're seeing, especially with gas prices rising on, on climate activists. We move to the to NAFDAQ, the National Agency for Food and Drug Administration. Uh, the Director General, Professor Mojishola Adeye, she was talking, up, she was had a press conference to uh, commemorate, her, I think, her fourth year in office or so. NAFDAQ is looking to target a 70% drop in pharmaceutical imports, 70% of what we use here as far as drugs and so on and so forth. 70% of them are, are, are imported. So what they're doing is they give five-year licenses to pharmaceutical companies in Nigeria. And they're saying that in the fourth year before a license renewal, the companies have to show proof of partnerships with local um, pharma companies in Nigeria in order to boost um, um, development of uh, pharmaceutical products. They're also saying that by 2022, they will hopefully start producing vaccines here because the NAFDAQ has submitted, according to them, a, uh, a follow-through on the World Health Organization requirements for vaccine production. Now, Analysts are saying that this is down to power. If you want to improve uh, in-house manufacturing, whether it's pharmaceutical products, whether it is whatever it is, power is what we have to focus on. So we'll see how that goes. Boss Mustafa, um, Secretary to the Government of the Federation, he was at the third National Anti-Corruption Summit in Abuja, saying that Nigeria's spending on overheads, the government spending especially, is still a problem, it's still an issue. He said between 2012 and 2014, 60% of government overheads was spent on 
travel, maintenance, welfare, stationaries, and, and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> he also mentioned ministries, departments, and agencies. MDAs, their spending went from 3.6 trillion in 2015 to 7.9 trillion in 2020. That number is almost double what Nigeria has budgeted for capital expenditure. So, you know, the Buhari administration only has a year to go and spending is still very, very heavy. The Orosayan report still has not been uh, implemented. We go to World Remit, um, which is the remittance company. They released a cost of Christmas around the world, seeing as it's December 1st and people will be focusing on Christmas. And apparently, you know, Christmas takes up uh, a huge bulk of uh, household income spending. They looked at 14 countries. Nigeria was one of them, Ghana, France and so on. If take a look at this next uh, slide here, you'll see a breakdown of uh, Christmas. So you've got Christmas food in purple, Christmas decorations and, and I guess dark lavender and Christmas gifts in gray. So Lebanon spends about, what's that, 49% of their uh, household income on gifts. Canada and France, the same thing, majority of that. If you look at Africa, it gets a bit interesting. Cameroon only spends 10% on their household income on Christmas spending on food. 69% goes to decorations. Kenya, 59% goes to gifts. Nigeria, you trust us, we are not with Ghana. 43% of our spending is on food, 36% is on decorations, only 21% on gifts. Personally, if you ask me, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with food as to what to spend money on. Ghana, 60% of their Christmas spending goes to uh, food, 17% goes to um, uh, gifts, and then, sorry, uh, decorations and 23% uh, goes to uh, gifts. And then what we were debating before we came on air, Rwanda Air and Angola have uh, suspended flights to uh, South Africa. I mean, so much for African unity. I thought, you know, folks were saying that Africa was united behind South Africa and Ramaphosa was saying that um, it's unfair that Western nations have banned flights and they should reopen. But as Doctor was saying earlier on, self-sufficiency and safety. Angola and Rwanda have suspended flights to so, so uh, like South to Africa. So, that. yeah. I, I think in this conversation, we keep getting something wrong. But the fact that a particular genome sequence in about a variant happened in the country, it doesn't mean that that is the prevalent variant in that country. It could have been everywhere, even before it was sequenced. It's just the case that it was sequenced in that country, and the country should be applauded by even telling the world that, oh, there's a variant like this. So it is as a result of the sequencing that will spur other people in other parts of the world to sequence more, and they will get to see more of that variant, because it's what you look for, really, you find. Mm. If South Africa didn't mm. sequence and say there's something called this variant that was finally named, other countries will not look out for it in their sequencing. So for what it's worth, this sequence might have been on, this variant might have been on for even longer than this, but because it wasn't highlighted. I'll give you an instance. It's just like, Rotus, when you buy a Land Cruiser. Hey, yes. <laughs> okay. You start to see and notice more Land Cruisers. 2021 the, model. 2021 yeah. model. Yeah. You start to notice more Land Cruisers on the streets. Right. But before you bought a Land Cruiser. I didn't notice you them. You wouldn't right, notice right, it. Right, so right. I, I just think that's what, what's happening even more. And but, we should be careful. But the cases in Nigeria came from South Africa. The cases that uh, now yeah, uh, the, the, the disease two control cases center yeah. that we have so far, other came countries have more. Right. So for me, it, I'm not donning a cape for South Africa or Nigeria or anybody else. We have to decide: do we trust the science or not? Right. Because anything less than scientific based, you know, policy is pseudoscience. Mm. And then what distinguishes you from the completely bonkers? You are non-types. Right. There's really the, where, where do you draw the line at that point? Pseudoscience is not acceptable. That's really my point. If the dominant strain is Omicron in a country, then there's evidence to support a travel ban. If it is not, then why? And if it is a dominant strain in one country, that doesn't mean every country in that region is affected. It should be based on science. Right. And we cannot divorce race from it. To so say Rwanda and Angola have followed suit, so they're not racist. I know female misogynists. There's some people who internalize the pressure prejudice has been directed at them. If you direct something at somebody long enough, they will start to believe that they are inferior in some way. Mm. And people who are African can also believe that of Africa. That's really not the point. The point is to just 
follow the science. I also had my doubts about WHO in the beginning of this um, pandemic. Yeah. I was listening to Donald Trump and was becoming quite convinced that, frankly, yes, China is such a big donor. Can we trust them? Do they have the credibility? But at some point, I found myself saying, I'm not going to take a vaccine unless it has WHO, you know, has put a stamp on it. Right. So you have to decide, do you trust them or you don't? They are the ones who are saying that yeah. travel bans are really quite pointless. So do we believe in science or not? That's really the bottom line. So much more for well, the FCTA. The entire process should be science-driven. Yeah. The residual point is that the international system is a rules-governed system. The other major point about the international system is that countries look out for themselves first. first. And then, of course, the morality of it is about global solidarity, global equity, justice, and all of that. Those are the three main pillars. And each country can, uh, based on the definition of its own sovereign interest, take certain decisions, whether the issue is, uh, you know, a disease or any other challenge. Now, as for Christmas, well, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, what uh, that uh, report is based on about Christmas plan. But what we know about this particular Christmas in 2021 is that all the original calculations have changed. Uh, the travel and tourism industry has been upended. Pops and restaurants have been receiving uh, cancellations. Even when people are told that there is no definite scientific position yet on Omicron, uh, people are trying just to be careful, mm. particularly as the big message out there is that, look, take precautions. You have a responsibility to protect yourself. So this may not be the same Christmas like the other Christmases that we knew uh, before, uh, you know, before uh, COVID-19, and that may... Uh, you know, affect uh, the projections uh, that that particular report uh, you were referring to has put forward. In the UK today, for example, mm. uh, the Prime Minister is saying, look, go out there, stage your nativity uh, uh, place, don't cancel uh, Christmas uh, visits. But the, the head of the UK uh, health agency mm. is saying something else. Right. And, you know, uh, Tory MPs, 33 of them, uh, you know, protesting and saying, look, uh, you are going to destroy Christmas. You are causing panic within the country. And it's like that in other parts of the world. So mm. this may ha end up being a Christmas like no other. Mm. And then, of course, when you talk about those figures in Nigeria, people will spend 43% on food. They will spend 23%. Who are those Nigerians? Right. The Nigerians that I think of and the Christmas people that I think of are those people inside Nigeria here who may not even know that it is Christmas because they are not going to spend anything. Mm. They are not going to buy gifts. They don't even have food to eat. You know, the people I think of are those people who are going to do Christmas in the context of deprivation in places like, uh, you know, uh, Sudan, in mm. Somalia, in Eritrea, and in other difficult parts of the world. So it's an elite conversation when we talk about Christmas spend. You buy gifts, you go to a restaurant, you know, uh, a significant proportion of the world population does not even know it is Christmas. Mm. Those are the ones we need to uh, uh, worry uh, about. As for uh, concern about energy transition that the Nigerian content uh, stakeholders were bringing up. Well, of course, yes. Uh, at the uh, uh, COP26 uh, uh, climate summit, uh, conference, uh, summit in Glasgow, there was the Financial Alliance for uh, Net Zero mm. with over you know, 19 major financial institutions committing to the fact that they will no longer fund you know, fossil fuel based uh, projects uh, with effect from uh, 2022. Yeah. But, it's, you know, but there are doubts about their commitment, just as there are doubts about the sincerity of the many uh, commitments that were made at that uh, COP26. So I'm not surprised that it came up. And, uh, you know, Nigerian content officials saying that this is already affecting the investment regime framework uh, within the uh, oil and gas sector in Nigeria, where it could get worse. But what is all that talk about? Oh, PIA, you know, we attract investments. On one hand, yep. you say there is a threat to investment. On the other hand, you the say PIA that, uh, you know, the uh, petroleum industry act is some kind of a bullet uh, silver uh, bullet. solution, yeah. silver bullet, uh, that will solve the problem. So I don't think that enough thinking has gone into all of this in terms of the statements made. What is the big takeaway? One. We need more creative thinking. We need mm. to think of multiple approaches. The energy transition may take up to 50 years, but it mm. is something that Nigeria will still have to deal with, as is the case also with other countries. Mm. And I don't see enough 
rigorous thinking uh, in that direction. We talk about diversification of the economy. Who is mm -hmm. thinking, you know, rigorously about yeah. that? So I hope somebody will have time to unpack mm -hmm. some of those uh, ideas that were just being thrown up and down at that particular conference. I wrote this real quickly. I don't know if you can get us the data mm. of how much Nigeria households spend on gas this Christmas. Oh, it's going to be reduced because of the price has gone up. But yeah. we'll find out. We'll, we'll find, find out. out. Yeah, That's very important. Yeah. I do dislike a contradiction, like you were saying. <laughs> well, moving on now to more business updates. Michael Wilson joins us from London. Good morning, Mr. Wilson. Uh, good morning. Another night of high drama, really, as far as the markets are concerned, as you'd expect. Um, a number of things. Jay Powell speaking in the United States. Uh, it's looked slightly more hawkish, I think. The CEO of Moderna wondering about whether existing vaccines are going to be enough to uh, to get to, to, to combat the new variant and so on. And oil prices, very, very schizophrenic, actually, which we'll come on to. So basically, Asia-Pacific stocks, um, pretty volatile, although they didn't really react in that kind of big sell-off that we saw in the United States at the beginning of the week. Again, all this assessment, you've been discussing it all morning. I mean, that's what people are trying to work out. Where is it? How powerful is it? And so on. Um, basically, uh, the South Korea's Cosby led the gains up about 2%. Uh, China relatively mixed. Uh, Shanghai Composite up a, a small amount. And they had um, a, decent, uh, a, de a decent kind of suspicion that their in industry, although it's actually falling down uh, slightly in terms of uh, its listings, is, is not doing too badly. That's the latest news um, out of Japan. As far as the United States is concerned, as you've been saying, and I have also saying as well, that um, Jer Jer Jerome Powell dropped the word transitory from when he was looking at inflation. So in other words, I, I think that that's pretty hawkish. And also Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen uh, was saying that, you know, they need to raise the debt ceiling in the United States because there may be this sort of the usual, you know, the government running out of money. So all that's actually starting again. Politics is, is back to the fore. Um, stock futures uh, rising ahead of the first trading day of December, whether or not there's going to be a uh, a, a sort of Santa rally or not, doubt it very much indeed. But we'll see at the moment all these variants are actually denting a lot of um, a, a, a lot of market activity. Dow futures are up about 60 points. Um, and uh, although they, they did turn down towards the end of the trade, the real trading day yesterday, overnight, slight improvement there. Um, the EU is bidding to challenge uh, Chinese influence around the world with a new uh, global investment plan. It's slated to be multi-billion euros. We're going to get details of it later today. It's going to be a global initiative to try to counter China's Belt and Road plan. Um, insiders say it'll, it'll set out what they describe as concrete ideas about infra infrastructure spending, climate and energy schemes and the rest of it. But we're going to hear it's going to be called the Global Gateway Initiative and we'll hear about it um, this afternoon. You were talking about what families are spending. Here in the UK, inflation could push up family spend to about £1,700 a year. Now, that, that's £1,700. So what's £1,700? Well, it looks like that uh, unquoted inflation is running between 46 and 5%. Um, again, it's down, to, uh, it, it's down to central banks to try to work out whether it is indeed transitory or sticky, as we've talked about many, many times. But it does look like the supermarket here are actually keeping prices down to make sure that everything's cool for Christmas and then after that well prices will start to go up. Um, oil had a bit of a virus slump. It's a very very schizophrenic thing this. It's, it's up very very slightly. I have to say talking to energy analysts yesterday the overall long-term view for 2022 is that prices will rise in 2022 but very much of course dependent upon the weather as, as all energy prices are. So far our meteorological office in its three-year look forward is predicting a mild winter this winter but I wouldn't trust I never trust weather forecasters because things change so rapidly I don't know what it's like with you but living on a small island with lots of weather passing over it sort of seems to change every day and gold really well still underwhelming as far as uh, being a, a sort of safe place to go people are not looking at it I suspect that what's going on there and I could be wrong is that people have sold out so far on equities that they're needing to get some cash and they're not necessarily spending it on gold they're looking to go back into the market <laughs> when prices actually settle down. That is the global view this morning, ladies and gentlemen. All right, thank you so much, uh, Michael. Reactions, you know, what would be your take on Jay Powell's point yesterday? Because, yes, 
Uh, for the first time now, we're beginning to understand that maybe because of Omicron, that uh, inflation is not really transitory any longer, and the effect of this will be last on the economy. And those bond buybacks, too, another big sticking point. I'd like to know your full take, you know, on all of this happening as regards uh, what the Omicron has, has put out there in the market. Uh, secondly, I'd like to talk a little bit about Turkey again. And I raise this because it's a big economy. It's a buoyant economy. And because of the outbreak of COVID-19, we have seen the impact of the Turkish economy on countries like the UK, with ventilators, with quick production and things like that. And if the Turkish economy does go down, it's going to affect a lot as regards this COVID-19 fight. Because their factories are nimble and they can produce quickly and they can get those ventilators, a lot of them, that they got into the UK. Isn't it time for somebody to tell <laughs> Rajiv Tai Erdogan to stop this madness? Yeah, I, I, I know. Uh, I, well, good, good luck with that. Give him a call. See what he says. Um, I, 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 I couldn't agree with you more about Turkey. I think it's a, very, it's a forgotten manufacturing industry. It's very, very nimble, as you say. It's very good at making making things and so on. Again, I have no idea why the president of that particular country thinks that lowering interest rates is a good way to tackle inflation. I, it's it's because he is. I think. I think. It's, I think I'm right. I think he's alone in the world. We've talked about that before. It's a very, very strange thing. Um, as far as Omni Omnicron's concerned, um, I, I suspect it'll hit all economies. The thing is, as you've been saying all morning, it's pretty pointless trying to predict things because nobody knows a what's effective against it and b how powerful it is. And do we? And uh, well, all right, I'll, I'll tell you a story. Right. So I am up. You, you've heard of Waterloo Station. It's one of London's biggest termini. Right. I'm there coming home last night, and I saw for the first time a line of police stopping people going on the tube unless they were wearing masks. So that, that's what we're down to now. So the MPs can debate it all they like and all the rest of it. The rules were no mask, you don't get on the underground system. And, and, and the, the reaction of people standing by to this normally, normally if there were anything authoritarian going on in this country, people would object to it. They didn't object to it this time. Everybody's thinking we might as well trust the science and be safe for the moment. That appears to be what's going on. And I can't help agreeing with what Tundin was saying here. You either trust the science or you don't. Unfortunately, that's the only way forward right now. Well, very quickly, I mean, in the case of, uh, of uh, Turkey, incidentally, you know, even with uh, Recep Erdogan, the president of Turkey, uh, promoting that is an orthodox view of uh, economic growth. He's been calling for more investments and encouraging investors to come to Turkey, and he's predicting a 10% GDP growth uh, in Turkey uh, within the first quarter of 2022. Well, whether that will happen or not uh, remains to be seen. But I was going to ask you about David Solomon, uh, the head of Goldman Sachs, who's been complaining about higher taxes uh, in New York, and how, yes, New York will not go away, and this is in an, in an interview that he granted, that although uh, New York will not go away, it will still remain relevant, uh, but that uh, if the cost of living is high, if taxes are high, uh, then perhaps uh, businesses and investors may begin to uh, look in another direction, perhaps towards uh, low tax uh, havens uh, or environments like uh, the state of uh, Florida, uh, which seems to be attracting uh, some attention. But would there ever be a time when uh, you know, New York will not be a major uh, investment uh, destination? I know previously, in the context of a Brexit, when some companies were moving out of London, I had raised the question about London, and you were very confident in saying that, look, London will remain a major financial uh, capital uh, for Europe. Will you say the same thing uh, for New York? Now, about, uh, you know, Jay Powell, uh, you know, saying that uh, uh, inflation is no longer a transit reward, that inflationary pressure is very high, and, uh, you know, um, Omicron has paused the return to economic normality. So what sh should we see? A much more quicker uh, tapering of the uh, asset purchase uh, uh, program, and then perhaps tighter economic controls, interest rates going up, cost of borrowing uh, going up. And how soon may that happen, considering the fact that the markets re reacted very swiftly, and in the stock market we've seen uh, you know, uh, the selling off of uh, uh, many shares. 
Right. First of all, Florida. I don't see it as a as as a as, a, as an opposite place for New York. If taxes go up and taxes rise in New York, they'll pay bankers a bit more. That's that, and it is a very explain. It's a very expensive place to live. The thing about New York is, it's it, you you cannot you cannot easily duplicate the financial systems that it sits on at the moment. That's why I'm also pretty confident about the city of London because people like British law. It's not political in the same way that it is in the United States, and they like the fact that thing that whatever you think. About the politics here, it's pretty pretty volatile at the moment. But generally speaking, um, it, it tends to it tends to sit where it is. As far as Jay Powell's concerned, I, I think he, what, what he'll do, what he'll be doing, if I may put words in his mouth, and I wouldn't presume to, but I, if I were him, I'd be looking at the jobs figures, the monthly jobs figures coming up in the United States, because in as much as the Fed and he have put any benchmarks as to when they're going to act, they're going to see whether the United States is coming back to reasonable levels of employment. Employment, and then he will begin to taper. I don't think there's any question of a doubt about that. It's really when interest rates start to go up. And interest rate rises are no bad thing if you're if you're stopping inflation, because inflation erodes everything, as we were talking about yesterday. Nobody wants to be reminded of what how, the damage that inflation can do. A little bit's quite good, a lot of it is not very good. So I suspect that he'll probably be waiting publicly for those jobs figures which we're going to get on Friday. Thank you for your time, Mr. Wilson.